live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Brian Mallow. Woo! Good evening, everybody. Hello, welcome to the Daily Planet Cafe here in the Nature Research Center at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And we have a fantastic program for you because it's Thursday. It's Science Thursday. And it's our science cafe, which I know a lot of you already know because how many people here, by round of applause, consider yourselves regulars here at the cafe? Look at that. Of course, I know it because I recognize all of you. And uh, thanks for coming and thanks for supporting us. So uh, we have a great program tonight. I want to make just a couple quick announcements and um, upcoming. So, you know, we do this every Thursday, but the first Thursday of each month is Science Trivia Night, and I know a lot of you know that as well, and that's a lot of fun. People compete in teams, and it's uh, led by uh, our historian of science, Dr. Paul Brinkman, who happens to be in the house. And uh, the rest of our Thursdays are science cafes and, uh, and, and similar sort of structures. Um, the structure is, how many people are joining us for the first time? Round of applause? Can you go? Excellent. Now, you are not joining us for the first time, sir. So I, I don't want to just call you out as a liar, but you're, you're not being entirely truthful because I've seen you conservatively here a hundred times over the past three years. So um, hardly your first. Um, so uh, we have some great programs coming up this month. I know we have a program on uh, another environmental program that has to do with economics. And we have a program on rabies, which I think is going to be very interesting. Um, also, you know what? All, you know, the museum's free, except for our special traveling exhibits and uh, the gift shop. Uh, the museum is completely free to everyone. And so if you'd like to help support free programming like that, you can become a friend of the museum. And it is the kind of friendship that requires a little monetary payment on your part. But you know what? I just realized something that I didn't know, that not only do you get uh, free admission to a lot of museums around the country, but you get a discount here in the Daily Planet Cafe. You get a 10% discount, which is the same discount employees get. And that in itself could pay for the membership. If you are a regular here at the cafe, that in itself, you could save the money just in the cost of savings of your food here at the cafes. So think about it. Um, you can help support all this great programming. So let's, uh, let's talk about our program tonight. The structure, as always, is a relatively short presentation, 20 minutes or so, by our, by our guest. And then the rest of the program is Q&A. So you provide the programming. So we count on you to ask interesting questions and join in the discussion. Um, we have a restroom right around the corner here. And food and beverage are available throughout the program. So our program tonight uh, is very timely. It's about sharks, and we've had an interesting summer in North Carolina, haven't we? Interesting. Um, if by interesting you mean in waist-deep water you could get attacked by a shark. Very interesting situation there. Um, still statistically not that likely, but this summer it was a little more than previous summers. So we might find out a little bit about that, but our guest is from Eastern. East Carolina University, you know what I just said? Is the music still on? I'm hearing something. Um, our guest is from East Carolina University, and the Institute for the uh, Coastal Science and Policy. And his specialty, though, and this is almost a little more frightening, because he studies sharks in the estuaries of North Carolina, which I wasn't quite aware of when I studied sharks. Uh, so we're going to so this will be a really interesting program, and he would be happy after his program to answer any of your questions. So uh, how about a nice round of applause for Chuck? Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, having me here tonight. I think that I'm pretty excited about the possibility to get one of these talks since I found out that they won a big fan of this museum. Um, I usually try to sneak in here every time I'm in Raleigh on an open marine boat. So we'll get right into it. Uh, I'll talk about some sharks that are in places that are not necessarily where you expect them. Here we go. 
So even as far back as colonial times, people were spotting sharks and other fish inside the estuaries in North Carolina. This is actually a uh, 17th century etching of Native American fishing methods at Roanoke Island, better known as the place where the video is these days. Um, also in the area of the Lost Colony, as far as the North Sharks have nothing to do with that. Um, but you can see a circle in the, uh, the bottom part of the, uh, the image there. So there was an awful lot of body head shark, which is a small species of hammerhead, that occurs in our uh, estuaries here in North Carolina. Um, but even back then, in the colonial times, we were finding things that uh, we're pretty sure were sharks. And if you really want to squint and kind of look in that square fixed in area that weird, um, you can almost make out another body head in there, and that's just a little slow, but it's still right. Um, this is interesting because sharks do live out of these big open ocean, wide ranging predators. You know, sometimes they cruise into the beach, and fish might bite people to see them jumping out of the water with seals in their mouths. But they do come into the estuaries, and estuaries are actually very important for these animals. So, bringing it a little bit more into uh, modern times and modern technology, this is not a matching, this is actually a satellite tagged great white shark type of group of search. Uh, named the Barry Lee, who in 2013 had a track that looks like she swam into Overcoat Inlet, kind of spent some time back there behind Overcoat, and then they came back out the other side and had her somewhere there. Um, there was a margin error on these tags, so there was some debate over whether or not the uh, shark actually went into the estuary. Um, and then two years later, this past winter, this is, uh, this is January 2015 here. Another great white shark by the name of Catherine came so far in the middle of the sound that she almost got into the middle of the river. And even accounting for a margin of error or something like 30 miles, there's no way that she's outside of the middle of the sound. Um, so she just clearly came into the estuary for something. You can actually clearly see that track go through Overcoat and Hunter, or no, no more than anyway, um, down towards uh, the Catholic Peninsula there, and then back out probably Hatteras and again, where she spent some time on the Cape Hatteras. Um, Catherine seems to like the Carolinas, and the great white shark is hanging around off the coast, uh, typically she's out in the Gulf Stream. Um, but she tends to uh, stay in the Carolinas way beyond the typical winter time that great whites are around here. So even with modern technology, we're finding sharks in the south and in the estuaries, and things that are still surprising us. So I study sharks. I mean, they're not the, uh, they're not the most commercially viable animal. Uh, people are scared of them, they can chase the tourists away. But they are important in commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, in 2012, recreational fisheries for sharks were uh, worth over $1 billion to the state. That was a drop in the bucket compared to things like flounder and red drum. But sharks seem to be increasing exponentially in importance uh, for the recreational fishing economy. Uh, for the commercial fisheries, they seem to have a social value that goes a little bit beyond just their market price. Um, they're actually these to be stock gap species that fishermen target. Uh, during kind of mean times in the winter, particularly the dogfish species, um, while they're waiting for things like Spanish mackerel and deep mackerel and flounder to come back in when the water warms up. So the sharks aren't necessarily worth that much at the market, but they do help fishermen keep gas in the boat and lights on at home um, during some of the off seasons. Uh, there are conservation concerns for some of our local species here. Uh, North Carolina is one of the few places on the East Coast where you can still get decent concentrations of scalped hammerheads and dusky sharks. These are species that have declined by as much as 75 to 9 percent in terms of their populations, probably mostly due to overfishing, but some of these species also depend on nearshore environments and estuaries for reproduction. So they may be suffering from habitat degradation as well. Um, their interactions with other species, which I'll touch on in, uh, in more detail in a little bit, um, are particularly interesting to me. Uh, by interacting with other species, they can actually affect things all the way down to the seafood on our plates. And in that same vein, a shark's presence in an ecosystem suggests that there's an intact food web, which is a healthy ecosystem. Um, so if a shark's in the water, odds are that you've got everything else that's supposed to be in the water there. Um, their interactions with other species can also help promote ecosystem health, being a top apex predator. They can kind of regulate some of these species that would normally breed out of control and cause problems otherwise. And then this summer, it's been thrown into pretty striking relief that their interactions with humans can be pretty significant. Um, North Carolina averages maybe one or two shark attacks per year. Um, the previous record was five attacks in one year, and I believe that was in 2001. Um, and this year we had eight in the span of three weeks. Thankfully, they have since tapered off, and uh, people are getting back into the water. Um, 
and it's certainly not for a lack of people in the water or a lack of sharks that those attacks are normally pretty rare. So going into the, uh, and there, I will warn you, there are some moments of gore in this uh, in this presentation. Why talk about sharks? You can't show things bitten in half. Um, so this is a red drum. I'm not sure how tall this guy is, but he's working at the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries uh, Longline Survey. And the drum, when it was alive, was probably about as tall as he is. Um, so pretty, uh, pretty good-sized drum if you actually had it on your hook. And something came along and ate half of it. Um, more than likely a shark, judging by the semicircular bite. But their interactions with other species can actually uh, impact the entire ecosystem through uh, interactions referred to as um, as trophic cascades. So they exert these top-down effects on ecosystems. So this is uh, loosely based off of some research in Shark Bay, Australia, which is very aptly named because every summer they have these kind of terror raids of tiger sharks that come through there. Um, so tiger sharks come in in massive numbers. They hang around for the whole summer, then they leave in the winter, uh, which is reversed. Their summer is in January, February down there because it's the southern hemisphere and it's weird. Um, but these tiger sharks show up and basically alter the entire ecosystem while they're there at this time of year. Um, while the tiger sharks are there, uh, sea turtles are afraid to go into areas where there are fewer escape avenues. So they won't go, ironically, into shallower water, um, where normally as humans we think of as being safer from sharks. Sea turtles, because they swim a lot faster than they walk, um, depend on having a lot of water around them to be able to have more escape routes from, uh, from these tiger sharks. The same thing with bottlenose dolphins, and uh, flipper lied to you, sharks do eat dolphins on a fairly regular basis. Um, but in turn, that actually, uh, what they found by kind of trying to exclude um, some of these grazing animals like sea turtles and dugongs, which are Australia's equivalent of a manatee, uh, from some of these seagrass areas, is that when you have these grazing animals excluded from the seagrass area, the grass actually grows better. And you have multiple species of seagrass, and it just generally becomes higher quality habitat overall. Um, so by chasing sea turtles out of certain areas, sharks actually help promote seagrass growth. The flip side of that with, uh, with the bottlenose dolphin, um, in this particular ecosystem it functions as what's referred to as a uh, mesopredator, which is not an apex predator, it's kind of the middle management of the, uh, the marine predator system. Um, those dolphins are feeding on a lot of juvenile fish that are in there kind of rooting around in the seagrass looking for, uh, I used the croaker for this example here, but um, looking for things that hide in the seagrass, which tend to be, in North Carolina, they tend to be juveniles so of things we like to eat, like flounder, red drum, grouper, black sea bass, and even croak. Um, dolphins don't want to be in areas where there are a lot of sharks either, but those juvenile fish are like eating an individual piece of popcorn for us. The shark really doesn't care um, about harassing these fish that are, you know, smaller than one of its eyeballs. Um, so they're going to be after the dolphins. They're going to chase the dolphins away from these certain areas. That, in turn, is going to make life a little bit easier for those juvenile fish. And if you want to apply that same system to North Carolina, we have a lot of the same players here all the way down to the seagrass. Um, then that can lead to an increased abundance of things like flounder and red drum for us to later fish for and eat. So my main research objectives for my uh, dissertation are to understand estuarine habitat use by sharks. Um, estuarine habitat use isn't particularly well studied. Usually we're looking at shark habitat use. We're looking at a very broad scale. These are animals that, you know, move across entire ocean basins on their migrations. But what we're finding is even though they may range all the way over to Portugal and Africa during their migrations, um, they'll keep coming back to the same estuaries and the same nearshore areas over and over again to reproduce or feed or do some kind of behavior that's important to their survival. Um, once we tell where the sharks are going um, and how regularly they appear in these areas, we can then kind of overlay that over information that we already have about where other species are, things like marine mammals or sea turtles or fish or even shellfish in some cases. And we can start to kind of put together some of these potential interactions between sharks and other species. So my study site is uh, back in Core Sound in North Carolina. And I don't go through the entire Core Sound, um, because it's big, and I'm just one guy with a boat and a bunch of volunteers. Um, so the uh, so down there in the, uh, the bottom of the screen, that's Cape Lookout. Some of you guys may have gone down there and, uh, and spent a weekend before. Um, Shackleford Bank is that, uh, that barrier island across the bottom. And then across Beaufort Inlet from Shackleford Bank is Atlantic Beach, where a lot of people like to go and fish and surf. Back Sound is that area of blue that's between Shackleford Bank and where it gets green, which is where Beaufort and Harbors Island are. Um, 
So it's kind of a handy place to uh, to work out. Up. There are a lot of marine labs in that area, which usually uh, helps supply a lot of volunteers and even uh, some of the uh, marine labs even want to borrow stuff and my stuff inevitably breaks. Um, because gear that's targeting sharks can be a victim of its own success very quickly. Um, and, uh, and also, it's, uh, it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a, an abundance of boat launches, places to stay. It's just generally a very easy place to work. Um, it's also got a highly varied environment. A lot of those uh, sandy colored areas in the middle of the sound there pop out of the water at low tide. So you've got areas you can sample at high tide, and you can't even get the boat up onto at low tide. There's also a lot of seagrass in the area, a lot of marsh, oyster reefs, a lot of different varied habitats. It's a very good place to, in a very kind of compact area, test what habitat type sharks seem to prefer. So I go about catching these sharks using four different methods, uh, three of which are fairly effective, and the third or the fourth is pretty much just for fun. Um, but we use uh, we use gill nets and long lines primarily um, because the, uh, we found we actually get different species and the different types of gears. So there are some species that won't ever take a hook, but you'll get them fairly regularly in the gill net and vice versa. Um, and then we this year we started playing around with using drum lines to catch some larger species. So most of what we get with the gill net and long line are kind of juveniles. They tend to max out at about the four to five foot range. Uh, with the drum line, we've actually found out personally uh, that we can get sharks over eight feet long. Um, and then finally, while those gears are soaking, we, uh, we use some rod and reels to kind of catch what I like to refer to as bonus sharks, but mostly that's to uh, kind of kill time while the gear is soaking. We let these gears soak for about half an hour because uh, that's a short enough time period that the sharks aren't usually overly stressed by the time it gets to them, uh, because we want to tag them when we actually catch them. So we have four target species, and I call them the four Bs. Uh, that wasn't on purpose, they just happen to all start with a B. Um, so they're the black nose, the black tip, the bonnet head, and the bull shark. And when we catch these sharks, we basically put them through the entire alien abduction scenario. Um, so we get them up onto the deck, and we, uh, we roll them on their back, and when the sharks, and actually work this works on rays as well, um, when they're on their back, they go into a translate state called tonic immobility. Um, so they will literally pass out when you roll them on their back. Um, They'll snap out of it if they can't breathe, so that's why we put a, a hose in their mouth to keep water flow over the gills. That also keeps them alive while we're working them up. Um, and then we surgically implant an uh, acoustic tracker tag into them. So yes, they were abducted. Yes, there is something in them, and yes, we're using it to track them. So they're not paranoid. We're actually after them. Um, so then we uh, we look at uh, so then we have these receivers placed out there in this area called Middle Marsh. It's right in the middle of Back Sound. It's got the two main channels that lead from Beaufort Inlet to Barden's Inlet, which is the inlet inside of Cape Lookout. Um, so basically, species that move in and out of the inlets to get to these uh, into the estuary, um, they pretty much have to pass by uh, Middle Marsh unless they're going straight up the river into Newport River. Um, so we've got receivers placed around in different habitat types around Middle Marsh. So we have receivers right now placed in seagrass and sand flat habitats. Um, and the receivers that are in purple on that map are the ones we already have out. And we've actually just entered into a partnership with the, uh, the Ocean Tracking Network, which is a, uh, a group that specializes in tracking marine species. They're based out of Nova Scotia. They're going to be loaning us a handful of receivers to get some other uh, habitat types covered there. So we're going to use those to monitor tag sharks in the deep channels, um, to look at the oyster reefs. And we also are, if we can, if we have enough receivers and enough room, um, we're going to try to pair them up so that we have each habitat type covered uh, close to and farther from the inlet, uh, because we're finding that that might make a difference for some of these shark species as well. So this is where we've surveyed so far. Um, you may have to kind of squint to see some of these shapes. But in, uh, in blue, we have our long line sets, and those are circles. Uh, in red triangles, we have our gill net sets. The black stars are where we've dropped the drum line, which is usually just a single drum line with a single really big hook and really strong leader on it, um, usually baited with something big. Uh, everything about the drum line is big. And then um, if you look down towards Cape Lookout, there's actually one lonely little white square that you may have to really look to see. Uh, that's because we got out there and the current was ripping too fast and it was just way too sketchy to deploy our other gears. So that's our one and only rod and reel only site. And we actually did catch some sharks down there. Um, so all told, we have over 150 uh, sites that we've sampled so far. We pick them randomly before we go out. So that way we're never sampling the same place too often twice. 
Um, and we have some built-in flexibility there, too, because the flip side of this place being easily accessible is that there are a lot of tourists and locals and commercial fishermen down there. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not in their way. So we have some flexibility built into the site. We have enough room to set the gear around to the other users. Um, so some areas we have a little bit more uh, tightly compacted in terms of sampling effort than others. That mainly has to do with the fact that they're just smaller areas. Um, and if you look, I wish the laser pointer was uh, was working, but we actually have three sites that are right next to the Duke Marine Lab because uh, we like to scare people with the Duke Marine Lab. So this is what we've caught so far. Um, as of right now, and this includes data from this past Sunday, um, so you guys are getting the, uh, the cutting edge stuff right here. Um, we have 105 sharks and 37 rays um, of these species here. And uh, the ones that are marked with an asterisk are the ones that basically we arbitrarily decided uh, we had enough of, and in this case, are arbitrarily cut off as we had more than uh, more than 10 or 10 or more. Um, or actually, it was five or more because we do the black tips on there. Um, those are the ones basically we were confident that we have enough numbers to actually run statistics on and tell you more than just, oh, we caught a handful of sandbar sharks. But we have gotten quite a few species, and this is broken down by gear. So GN is the gill net, LL is long line. DL is the drum line, and RR is rod and reel. Um, so you can see that if we didn't have the long line sets in there, we actually would not have two of our more common sharks, which is the black nose and the black tip. And we'd be very much undersampling the Atlantic sharp nose sharks as well. Um, also noteworthy is we do have one species of ray that shows up very often, and that's the southern stingray. And for some reason, nobody ever wants to talk about the rays. And when you think about it, they're really just as targets and stepped on a bunch of times. Um, so I will actually be talking about the Southern Stingray. It's about time those, uh, those poor little rays got their deal. So this is a uh, discriminant function analysis, and this is the most technical thing I'm going to bring up during this talk. But the idea behind this analysis is that we try to predict what the shark species is going to be based solely on the environmental conditions that we have. Um, so these, again, these are the six species that we show is based on uh, having enough numbers to actually make something like this work. And the, uh, that kind of spidery shape in the middle with the, uh, with the um, variable names coming off of it, those are the, uh, the biplot rays. So the farther along the center of those circles representing these species is along that ray, the higher the value is. Um, so all the way over to the right side, you have the black hip shark kind of down there in the lower right-hand corner. Um, his position is telling us that we typically catch black hip sharks at our highest temperatures, um, pretty far from the inlets. Um, and in water that's fairly salty. And then on the other side of the graph, you have the spiny and smooth dogfish. And these species tend to be species that show up when the water's a little bit colder. Uh, so our sampling effort goes from April to about November. And these are the species that show up at the beginning and the end of the, uh, of the sampling season. So they're winter species, and we're just catching the tail end of their presence in back sound um, at the beginning, or the very beginning of their presence at the end of the, uh, the sampling season. Um, the Atlantic sharp nose shark, the black nose shark, and the southern stingray are actually all kind of clumped together in one mass. So this analysis is actually working pretty well. Uh, we have about a 63% um, correct classification based, again, solely on the environmental conditions you expect to find these sharks in, but it varies by species. We're classifying black tip sharks about 85% uh, of the time correctly. Um, the dogfish species even more so. They're getting uh, classified correctly about 90% of the time. And that's because these species have certain unique environmental characteristics that set them apart from the others. The stingray, the black nose shark, and the Atlantic sharp nose shark are classified correctly much less often. They're kind of dragging the average down because they all kind of are jacks of all trades that have very generalized habitat preferences. Um, so they all kind of cluster together, and the program has a hard time telling them apart. So what that's telling us is that these three species actually have a pretty high likelihood of interacting. So I'm just going to go through each species, uh, showing you a hopefully um, friendly looking and adorable picture of each one. Uh, so this is the Atlantic sharp nose shark, far and away our most common summer species. Um, and they're pretty small. Most of the sharp nose sharks we capture are actually about a foot long or less. And those are the, uh, the young of year pups. Those are pups that were born that year. They really utilize back sound and core sound as nursery habitats. And we've confirmed this 100% because we actually caught a pregnant female that gave birth on the deck. Um, so now shark midwife is on my CV. So when I start applying for jobs around here, look for that. Um, and you can call me out if I forgot to include it. Um, 
so the, uh, the shark nose sharks are definitely using this area as a nursery habitat. Um, we actually catch, we do catch adults. Uh, these are not a very large or intimidating species. Uh, they max out of about four feet in length. Um, so even the adults are not very big or scary, but they are very common. And they're best known in this area for stealing people's bait or being caught when they're looking for literally anything else. Um, so these, uh, these sharks are typically regarded as kind of a pest species in the area, but they are very common and probably pretty uh, ecologically important in the area. Um, the next two I graphed together because these are kind of our two middleweight sharks. Um, these are the black nose and the black tip shark. The black nose is there on the, uh, on the left hand side and the black tip is the one with the black tips on the right side. Um, the black tip can be a little bit deceptive though because a lot of the sharks in the area as juveniles actually have black margins on their fins. Um, so there are a couple other things like the proportion of the fins to the rest of the body or the position of the dorsal fin we have to look for. But what's really, uh, what's really, I think, really cool looking on the black tip and one way to tell them apart is they have this neat white racing stripe down their side. Um, so that's one way to tell that you're dealing with a black tip or a spinner, which is a very closely related species. Uh, the black nose is named because when they're young, they have a very dark kind of smudge on their nose that unfortunately fades away as they get older. Um, and older are, they're typically mistaken for juvenile lemon sharks because the shark is kind of a yellowish green color. Um, and the, uh, on the map, the, uh, the black nose are actually represented in yellow, and then the black tips are actually represented in black. And you can see that the, uh, even though there's a little bit of overlap in back sound, the black tips are much more willing to go farther up in the estuary, where the, uh, the black noses like to hang out in this area that I'm starting to call Black Nose Alley, which is between Beaufort Inlet and Middle Marsh. And they, uh, they tend to like to cruise around in those deeper channels and occasionally wander up onto the sand flats. Um, but they don't like to stray too far from the inlets, where the black tips seem to be uh, more of a... a a more of a species that's a little more comfortable in the estuary, and they kind of run all over the place in there. Um, so because these species tend to be similar in size, an adult black nose shark maxes out at about five, five and a half feet long, which corresponds to the juvenile-sized black tip sharks that we get in there. A black tip will reach eight feet uh, once it hits adulthood. Um, they, uh, they seem to stay out of each other's way. We have, this is the, these are the only two species that we've never caught together on the same set. Um, so we think because they're similar in size, they're probably also similar in feeding habits. They probably kind of avoid each other as a way to avoid competition. Here's the southern stingray, the poor unloved stingray. Um, we're not actually trying to smack it over the head with that stick in that picture. It's, uh, we actually are trying to measure it. That was a rather large stingray. We taped off uh, length measurements on the end of the net that we usually use to scoop these things up. Um, so it was a pretty big one. We get southern stingrays of all shapes and sizes in this area. This is a very important stingray habitat. We get small juveniles all the way up to uh, an individual that was just shy of six feet across. Um, we only know it was that long, or that wide rather, um, because we got him to pancakes to the side of the boat and we measured him um, in comparison to the, uh, to the East Carolina University letters down the side of the boat. And the ECU letters were only a little bit longer than he was wide. Um, so these stingrays can be very, very large, uh, or they can be very, very small and pretty cute. Um, so this is why you do the stingray shuffle when you're down there in the, uh, the Carter County beaches and especially in the estuaries. I can't tell you how many stingrays I've picked uh, just wandering around in the estuaries in there. But um, if you're not directly stepping on them, they usually just uh, flutter away from you. And sometimes they'll actually swim up and check you out, and it's pretty cool. Um, so these are another species that, much like the sharp nose shark, kind of ranges all over the estuary. They, uh, they're very generalist in terms of uh, habitat. Um, this is the smooth dogfish, and interesting story behind these guys. They do use back sound as a nursery. We catch both adults and, um, and juveniles in there. We have gotten pregnant females of this species as well. Um, they did not give birth on the boat, but they looked like they were about ready to, and they were definitely angry enough to suggest they were ready to. Um, this pound for pound is probably the strongest shark that I have to deal with on a regular basis. They have very kind of like small raspy teeth. They primarily swim around and eat shrimp and uh, small crabs. Um, despite that, they are like a snake. They're basically just a tube of muscle with fins. And they'll wrap around you, smack you with their tails, uh, just generally be very difficult to handle. Um, again, not dangerous if you're in the water with them. This is a crustacean eater. Um, and we get adults, but we get adults at a very, very kind of narrow time frame. So the adults cruise in in, uh, in late April to early May, and uh, they make what I like to call a salmon run. Um, they basically come in, 
and then after they leave, we start catching their pups in various areas. Um, so it looks like the adults come in for maybe a month tops, and there are males and females mixed in there, so odds are they're probably mating as soon as birth occurs. Um, and then the, uh, the juveniles tend to uh, hang around for the rest of the summer and probably go elsewhere once the water starts to cool down. And then last but not least, this is a species that's very near and dear to my heart. If anybody follows me on Twitter, I'm named after this species. Um, I did my master's degree work on these guys uh, looking at the feeding habits. So it's kind of nice that spiny dogs have just followed me into my dissertation. Um, and we, uh, we only catch these guys at the beginning and the end of the sampling season. Um, but interestingly, they tend to hang around in back sound and around Cape Lookout much later into the season than they typically do elsewhere in North Carolina. Um, there is a large popul population of these guys that overwinter off of the Outer Banks, but they typically start to head north. And we know this because I've been involved in tagging these guys off the o out in the ocean, too. They typically start to head north, and there are very, very few of them left by about mid-April. Um, they'll start peeing in again off of New England, off of Delaware, off of the Chesapeake Bay, areas with a little bit cooler water. Not these ones. Um, these ones stick around in back sound into, uh, into June. And it's not uncommon for fishermen fishing there in Memo on Memorial Day to be uh, running into large schools of these guys. Um, and we actually actually ended up getting a little observation paper out of this because we found out they were the highest temperatures uh, that this species has ever been documented at on the East Coast. Um, so we're not sure why, but spiny dogfish are acting a little bit weird. Maybe it's because they just heard I was there. Um, but uh, they act a little bit weird in back sound and around Cape Lookout. Um, so we're not sure if these ones also migrate north or if there's a, if there are maybe a separate small population that goes offshore. We're hoping to start tagging them at some point to find out. So we do have some predator-prey interactions involving the sharks themselves. You saw that unfortunate red drum earlier. Um, to the left is a, uh, a black-nosed shark, actually one of the largest that we caught. The shark was four and a half feet long. Um, and it's something bigger than it came along and tried to eat it while it was on the line. Um, so it's got a really nasty bite on its back, and then there are actually puncture wounds on the underside of it. Um, so it's got a cutting wound on the top and puncture wounds on the bottom. And what that's telling us is that a shark with asymmetrical teeth came along and bit it. Um, now this is very common a, uh, among a family called the Carcharinidae, which includes the black nose itself, the black tips, and also the bull shark. Um, and looking at the size of that bite, the fact that it was willing to attack another shark, um, and just the, uh, the severity of the cut on the top, um, we have a pretty good guess that this was a rather large, probably at least six foot bull shark that came along to try to eat this black nose shark off of our line. Um, the black nose shark was actually um, still able to swim, so we let it go. Took off healthily, hopefully is uh, living a long, happy life, and uh, we actually saved its life after inadvertently putting it in greater danger. Um, so uh, that shark got away from that interaction. Um, the small little sharp nose shark that you see there kind of hanging out of the black tip shark's mouth did not. Uh, that black tip hit that sharp nose shark so hard that it actually came off the hook and it went up the leader, and then the black tip got hooked. So that was a milestone for the survey. We got two sharks on one hook. Um, and it actually, and it also showed us that blackhead sharks are a predatory threat to these young of year um, sharp nose sharks, which is important when you're looking at which sharks you're catching in the same sets and which sharks have overlapping habitat preferences. Um, the black tip was about typical for a, uh, for a juvenile sized black tip in that system, about three and a half, four feet long. Um, so these sharks will occasionally eat each other. Um, and then we actually started catching sharks that were big enough to eat the sharks that were eating the other sharks. Um, so these are the sharks that actually make the black tip shark look like a meso predator. Um, in the upper left-hand corner is a, uh, is a sandbar shark that's about five and a half feet long. We actually caught this shark up in the North River. So this shark was in a very narrow um, kind of marsh creek that uh, had a deep channel going through the middle of it. It was actually pretty tricky to set in there because we had a hard time finding room for our gear. Um, and then we haul up this thing. And uh, so this is a, um, this shark is probably large enough to be a threat to some of the smaller black tip sharks and black nose sharks. And then on the bottom there and along the side, um, this is the bull shark, and we actually had a, uh, we had a news crew out with us um, while we caught this guy. So this guy is pretty famous now. Um, I've heard he's about to be on the cover of the next Coast Watch magazine. Um, so this bull, and it's also uh, because this bull shark got so much media attention, it's probably single-handedly responsible for a lot of volunteers I've gotten since then. Um, and it was uh, it was actually caught on the first weekend that we experimented with drum lines. So this uh, definitely told us that yes, we need to 
put some more drumline sets out because these big eight foot sharks are out there um, and probably influencing where our smaller sharks want to occupy um, and we want to be able to document that they're there. So we're including the drum lines now um, in order to get a more complete picture of the shark community and how they might be interacting. Um, so this was this shark ended up being 8.2 feet long, um, so over 8 feet. Um, and I can tell you that my head, not that I tried this, but my head probably could have fit in its mouth. So the uh, moving forward, um, we are part of a, a group called the Atlantic Cooperative Telemetry Network or the ACT Network. Um, so while we have our small array inside Back Sound, uh, we coordinate with other researchers that are running arrays all up and down the East Coast. Uh, so this is the ACT Network's current coverage. It goes all the way from, uh, from the Gulf of Maine and Nova Scotia um, down to about Cape Canaveral uh, in Florida. Um, they're always adding new arrays. There are arrays that just went on um, in the past couple of years down in the Florida Keys. There's some going in in the Bahamas. Um, there's some going in off of Charleston, South Carolina. So we're getting very, very good acoustic coverage. And this network basically allows researchers like me that are kind of doing these alien abductions to sharks. So the aliens are all talking to each other. Um, if that uh, will make the sharks even more paranoid. Um, so when the sharks leave our general sphere of influence, we can still tell where they went because somebody else will pick them up on their array and send us the data. We do likewise. Um, we used to run an acoustic array off of Cape Hatteras that would catch green sea turtles from Cape Canaveral. Uh, we would catch sand tiger sharks and Atlantic sturgeon from just about everywhere. Uh, we had a few white sharks from Cape Cod. Um, so in addition to my own dogfish and sandbar sharks, we were getting all of these things that other people would tag. Um, so it's a great way to kind of automatically network with people because everybody loves getting their data. Um, and, uh, and allows us to really look at these long-range movements once they leave state waters. Um, the other thing we've just started, and actually I was just helping launch this thing yesterday, um, is the, uh, the Blackbeard, which is our liquid robotics wave glider, now owned by East Carolina University. Um, it's basically a, uh, basically a surfboard with a bunch of instruments hanging off of it. Um, among those things is an acoustic receiver. So this thing will be tooling around, picking up our tag sharks and other tagged animals. Um, so with those kind of glimpses of the future, uh, I'd like to acknowledge particularly all of the, uh, the different um, volunteers we've had. Uh, we've had a wide variety of people come out there with us, uh, people from ECU, people from the Duke Marine Lab, people from UNC Marine Lab. Um, we haven't had anybody from NC State yet. Um, so I guess while I'm in the triangle, I'll call out NC State and ask, well, why aren't you helping me in the shark boat? Um, and then, of course, we've had all these people, that, uh, all these groups that have helped us out. North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries has shared data with me, particularly in Pamlico Sound. Um, East Carolina University, when times have, tight, have been tight, have uh, pitched me some departmental funds. North Carolina Sea Grant is now funding this project that I've been talking about with you today. Um, the North Carolina Estuary Reserve allows us to play around in Middle Marsh without getting too angry at us. And finally, the OTN is going to be loaning us receivers. Um, so come on out on the shark boat. You too can have your very own picture of either you holding a shark and smiling or sleeping on the bow of the boat. <laughs> and with that, uh, the Sharpie with a Sharpie, and I will take your questions. How about a nice round of applause for Chuck Bangley? And uh, so, as always, so we'll we'll open the floor to questions. I mean, I have a microphone, and Katie has a microphone. We ask that, and while Chuck is answering one question, you can get our attention. Um, Chuck, let me kick us off by asking you. Um, so, you know, sharks are big, charismatic animals, but um, a lot of people study animals that people love, and uh, and even if there are paleontologists that study T. Rex and it's fierce like that, people love them, maybe because they don't exist in reality. You study something that a lot of people fear and hate and wonder why you want to protect, for instance. Um, so what is that like to uh, have that relationship, and why do you like sharks so much? Uh, well, to answer the last question first, um, I like sharks because everybody goes through a shark and dinosaur phase, and I didn't outgrow the shark phase. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's the short answer. Um, no, they're just really, really fascinating animals. I mean, if you want to, you know, get into a contact between sharks and dinosaurs, sharks started showing up about 400 million years ago. So they were pretty old when the dinosaurs showed up. They've outlasted them ever since. Um, so this is something that's pretty perfectly evolved for, uh, for living in the ocean. Um, maybe not so well evolved for dealing with us and our pollution and fishing pressure. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of getting back to the, the interactions of those species I talked about before, 
we're still kind of in the process of understanding how these apex predators ultimately help us. And economically, we do depend on some shark populations for, uh, you know, fisheries and things like that. Um, they have other economic benefits like catch and release, recreational fishing, or even diving. I mean, the, the dive industry loves the fact that we have so many sharks here off in North Carolina. Um, I mean, you can dive on some of the wrecks that are in, uh, in about 90 feet off of the outer banks and see just piles and piles of sand tiger sharks. Um, and they're very fierce looking. They're ultimately very harmless sharks. They're pretty docile. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot to love about sharks. And I would argue there are a lot of people who love sharks. Um, so, I think 